Um, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us on um, this Twitter space. Welcome to all our listeners joining us um, this morning, this afternoon, depending on your location. My name is Comfort Aero, I'm President and CEO of International Crisis Group, and I'm joined by my colleague Richard Gowan, Director of our UN team, Multilateral Engagement. Um, we're both with you here um, in New York, um, in a very rainy um, New York at the start of the UNGA week, the United Nations General Assembly week, the 78th session of the UN. And also nothing better than clarifying the mind in the morning with lots of rain. Um, but with the cloud storms rising on geopolitical tensions, this is a really good way to start off the week to give you all a taster of what we're watching, what we're looking out for, and what will be at the top of our headlines um, week. And of course, as most of you listening will know, um, of course, we are facing very sort of major power um, divisions um, occurring. This is a particularly testing time for the United Nations as world leaders gather here. Um, the future of multilateral crisis management um, is in doubt. Um, significant political divisions, resource gaps, um, humanitarian catastrophe challenges. Most of you would have been watching the very devastating situation unfolding in Libya. And beyond Ukraine, just a litany of challenges that we're seeing um, across the world, whether it's in the Sahel that has witnessed a series of coups, um, Sudan facing a very precarious um, transition, Haiti and Afghanistan to name a few. So huge fangirl of Richard Gowan and I wanted to take advantage of being with him here this week to ask him what he is personally watching, what he sees as sort of the big highlights for this week that we should be paying attention to as watchers of the United Nations. So Richard, what's on top of your mind? What should we be paying attention to? You see as the highlights this week of, of at the start of Unger Week. Over to you. Well, thank you, Comfort. Um, it's uh, great to have you in New York. Um, and I should uh, say to everyone that uh, Comfort is charging around the city meeting foreign ministers and, and senior officials. We're keeping her very busy. Uh, what we're watching for in the General Assembly is really two things. Uh, the first is that um, almost, almost as famous as comfort, um, President Zelensky is here from Ukraine. And this is the first time Zelensky has come in person to the General Assembly since Russia's all-out aggression began in February of last year. Uh, in 2022, he was only able to appear via video link. I think Zelensky is going to dominate uh, headlines around the General Assembly. It's a great opportunity for him to try and lobby and win hearts and minds amongst the wider UN membership, especially uh, from non-Western countries. Uh, but in addition to Zelensky and his appearance, uh, we're also focusing on uh, concerns of other countries and other, other regions, because the developing members of the UN, uh, the G7 countries, have really made a big push for this week to be all about uh, their concerns and the state of the global economy. Uh, today, there is a big meeting taking place um, on the Sustainable Development Goals. The message that we're hearing loud and clear from developing countries is that they need a huge amount of help to fight poverty and to manage challenges like debt. And what the leaders of these countries are saying to the West is, yes, Ukraine matters. We, we understand why you want to focus on Ukraine, but you also need to focus on our issues and our, uh, our fears about the state of the global economic climate. So those, those are the two dominant themes um, that we're tracking in New York. As you said at the outset, Comfort, there's a, an almost endless number of other topics to track around the UN. There are meetings coming up over the next few days on Afghanistan, especially on the situation of women in Afghanistan. Uh, there's a ministerial meeting about the crisis in Sudan. Uh, there's no shortage of, of crises to focus on. Um, but I think ultimately it's going to be Zelensky and global development that are the top stories um, through the week. Um, thanks, Richard. And I just want to remind our listeners, um, the audience, you can send through questions via um, X um, DM um, space as well. Richard, can I just press you? Um, because you said that Zelensky, you know, arrival 
um, here in New York is going to be sort of the, at the top of the agenda and tied to that will be inevitably um, how he messages um, to the General Assembly, but particularly leaders of the Global South, so-called Global South, you know, where he hasn't been sort of able to go to um, in the past, although there was a surprising visit, for example, um, in, in Riyadh um, for the Gulf um, GCC um, countries um, meeting as well. Um, I mean, look, this is a, an important moment for him. He'll be sharing the stage um, with one of the leaders um, of the Global South, um, President um, Lula um, da Silva for, for Brazil, who himself has made it very clear that this is now the time for diplomacy. So how do you, how does Zelensky get his message across? Because clearly we're in for a long haul here um, in Ukraine, and Ukraine is requesting consistently for, for more arms, ammunition, um, into Ukraine? How does he balance um, Lula's message for a time for diplomacy um, with his own um, call for continued um, support on the on the military front? I know you've often said he has to tread carefully, but what does that look like in, in Angawik, alongside all the other concerns that the Global South countries would have? Well, I think it's a, it's a delicate balancing act for Zelensky because this is very different to the G7 summit um, or the NATO summit earlier in the year when he was meeting with leaders who were primarily very supportive of Ukraine. Um, General Assembly, he will be speaking to a lot of uh, countries that have tried to stay non-aligned during the war, and even many non-Western countries that have supported Ukraine, for example, in previous UN votes, uh, do argue that Kiev should be willing to sit down with Russians sooner rather than later um, for peace talks. And as you say, that's something which Lula from Brazil has emphasized. It's something which President Ramaphosa from South Africa has tried to hear. I mean, I, I would say that the conventional wisdom amongst a lot of UN members is that there needs to be a diplomatic solution sooner rather than later. But you know, Zelensky has said um, absolutely explicitly that he doesn't believe that this is a moment for diplomacy. He doesn't believe um, that uh, he can have good faith conversations with the Russians and that a long war may be inevitable. Um, I think it's really important that Zelensky uses this appearance at the UN to explain his logic in plain terms to other leaders. I think he needs to lay out both in public and in private why he doesn't believe that um, peace talks are possible now. He, he has to show some respect for those countries that want peace talks, I think, but he has to tell them uh, that this is simply uh, an illusion um, right at the moment. If, if he doesn't get that right, he may well find that you know, Lula, Ramaphosa and others uh, use their appearances at the UN to uh, negotiation sooner rather than later. Um, so I think he really has to, he really has to strike this point um, very clearly and very persuasively. In addition to that, he can talk about other issues and he can talk about how Ukraine has tried to um, stabilize all food markets through the Black Sea Grain Initiative. He can go after Putin for quitting the Black Sea Initiative in, in July. Uh, there are lots of other themes that um, he can uh, he can talk up. I, I noticed that one of Zelensky's advisors on Twitter was recently calling for Security Council reform uh, that would allow countries like Brazil to have more more power in the institution. You know, Zelensky can can put on all those themes, but I do think he has to address the question of negotiations and why it's not the moment for negotiations head on. Um, Richard, thanks a lot. I mean, there are a number of things that you said in there, and I think the other highlight, at least what I'll be watching alongside with you and colleagues here, um, will be Lula's own arrival. He's, the, I think, the other hub ticket item here in terms of leadership. And he's going to be the figure attracting, I would imagine, alongside Zelensky most of the attention. And we all agree that he's the charismatic face of the Global South. You know, and he's and he has one advantage in that um, he will be speaking before um, President Biden. But two things that you said one you said in there that will obviously be of interest um, to the, the global majority as as we could call them, that of the global south, is around um, UN reform. Now, this time last year, Richard, um, you know, you said, I remember very clearly, you said that Biden had created a lot of excitement around reform. I mean, D Zelensky threw down the challenge about the need to reform this house, particularly the Security Council. But my sense um, is that um, the theme, the engine room is sort of is, has lost a little bit of momentum 
on reform and you know sort of reform blah 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 how serious is it what does it look like will people like Ula be able to to nudge and cajole um, the P5 to be more serious about that will the global will the global majority um, be able to steer that reform agenda um, for any meaningful way um, going forward what, what, do you, what do you think about about that I think we're going to be hearing a lot of talk about UN reform and Security Council reform uh, this year. Uh, as, as you say, I mean, Joe Biden raised expectations about the possibility of a reform to the Security Council at last year's General Assembly, when he said that um, the US wanted to explore options for changing the composition of the council, um, uh, potentially bringing in countries like uh, Japan and, and Brazil as, as full members. A, a year on, I don't think we've seen very much concrete progress towards a reform of that type. Uh, Linda Thomas-Greenfield, the US ambassador to the UN, uh, has done a lot of consultations with uh, other countries, trying to see if there's some way to get agreement on how to reform the Security Council. And we've even seen other big UN players like China. Um, Lost a little bit of momentum on reform and you know sort of reform blah 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 how serious is it what does it look like will people like Ula be able to like Ula be able to to nudge and cajole um the p5 to be more serious about that will the global will the global majority um be able to steer that reform agenda um for any meaningful way um going forward what, what, do you, what do you think about about that i think we're going to be hearing a lot of talk about un reform and security council reform uh this year uh, as, as you say, I mean, Joe Biden raised expectations about the possibility of a reform to the Security Council at last year's General Assembly, when he said that um, the US wanted to explore options for changing the composition of the council, um, uh, potentially bringing in countries like uh, Japan and, and Brazil as, as full members. A, a year on, I don't think we've seen very much concrete progress towards a reform of that type. Uh, Linda Thomas-Greenfield, the US ambassador to the UN, uh, has done a lot of consultations with uh, other countries, trying to see if there's some way to get agreement on how to reform the Security Council. And we've even seen other big UN players like China um, saying they want to see some sort of reform to the Security Council. But there are still very deep divisions over what that reform should look like, and also who should benefit from that reform. So the US, for example, uh, says that it supports um, India and Japan uh, as candidates for permanence. Um, China is very cautious about the idea of India getting a permanent seat on the Security Council, and it is absolutely allergic to the idea of Japan getting a permanent seat on the Council. And you know, uh, numerous other divisions of this type. My understanding is that Biden is going to refer to the need for council reform again this week, but I don't think the US is going to invest a lot more energy into trying to resolve this very complex um, set of, of diplomatic divides, especially with an election year looming. What's interesting is that while we don't see much hope for Security Council reform, there is a lot of interest um, across the UN membership in possibly altering the way that some other big multilateral bodies work. Um, developing countries are really keen to see uh, the way the World Bank um, is governed, uh, shaken up. Uh, they also want to see the World Bank and IMF change their rules on lending so it's easier for developing countries to get finance. And, you know, in a period of economic turmoil, I actually think that more UN members are, are really interested in how you reform the IMF and how you reform the World Bank than in the you know, deeply arcane, uh, deeply problematic field of Security Council reform. Yeah, I mean, I want to um, sort of agree with you on on that, um, Richard. I mean, it was interesting coming out of the G20, um, aside from the big news um, that we all welcomed about the African Union now being part of that. The other big issue was around um, the World Bank and the IMF as well. So just to let's just zoom in a little bit, because, of course, the other big leader that will be in town, um, given his speech tomorrow, it will be Joe Biden as well. And U.S. officials, from what we understand, Richard, say that the president wants to you know, play into the global south agenda 
at the General Assembly, that his agenda will, will be focused on on development. And can you clarify, confirm from your own sources, um, you know, are, that, that, that there are reports that labour rights, for example, will be touched on as the US is reading the room? And how then do we also deal with the, um, the tensions that we see, particularly around Western um, diplomats fighting very hard to compromise with the G7 on on the global economic issues that that you are that you are referring to, in a way to keep the the G seventy seven and all the others um, in the global majority in the room as well. So what we're hearing from our contacts in in the uh, U S system is that Biden very much does want to use his appearance in New York this year to indicate that he understands the concerns of developing countries. I think that the U S is well attuned to the fact that while it is focused on Ukraine, it does have to listen to and respond to uh, the calls of the of the global majority um, for uh, you know for changes to the way that international system works and efforts to deal with global economic problems. Um, I think that you will see in Biden's speech that although he will attack Russia uh, and although he will have some stern words for China. He's going to want to focus a lot more on uh, global development, on climate change and on, on global health, because he knows that those are issues that resonate well um, with leaders from Africa, Asia and Latin America. Um, he's also co-hosting an event with Lula from Brazil on defending labour rights. And what US officials say is that this is actually one, one area where Lula and um, Biden click. Uh, you know, they're both... Um, old school uh, politicians from the left who have always stood up for trade unions and Lula and Biden may differ over other sh other issues, including Ukraine, but they have a sort of shared interest in acting labor rights. So Biden is, is leading into leaning into that. Um, you know, I think this is this is all the right rhetoric. Uh, these are all the right themes. Um, and Biden is a pretty good performer on, on the UN stage. And I think that he will uh, give a strong speech. Uh, the problem is, is that a lot of observers from other countries will say that's a good speech, but is the US really willing to put resources into um, into international development, into climate adaptation in poorer countries, you know, in line in line with the rhetoric? Uh, there's just a very deep seated suspicion, I think, based on past disappointments, that Western leaders say the right thing at the General Assembly, but but don't follow through. And um, you know, Biden, uh, Biden sort of has to uh, face that, um, you know, face that scepticism, even if he gives a good speech. Uh, in terms of the negotiations that you were referring to between um, Western countries and the G77 over international financial issues, I, I think that broadly speaking, these negotiations have been difficult, but there is a, a consensus emerging. Um, you know, between the different blocks about uh, the need to make a big push on overhauling uh, the international financial institutions in, in the year ahead. Uh, there are lots of differences about how you should do that, how, how the negotiations should work, but actually there is a bit of a common understanding um, on the need for international financial reform. And if it is possible over the next year to really shake up the way that the World Bank um, and the IMF uh, treat um, poorer and debt distressed countries, if it is easier to get those countries financing, then actually that will, um, and I think that will help Biden and I think that will help other Western countries because they will finally be delivering on some of their, their big promises um, rather than making these commitments and then failing to follow up. Thanks, Richard. I, I just have a couple of questions more to ask you then before we check to see if any of our listeners have any questions. And um, I mean, you know, we, we issue every year and also this year our 10 challenges um, for the UN. And this year there's no shortage of, of choices. You know, the, the, the list is not exhaustive, um, but there's quite a number of sort of difficult challenges for the UN. But there was one thing that struck me in this year's um, challenges, um, Richard, um, said that the meeting, the, the UNGA's sort of formal theme this year is restoring trust and reigniting um, global solidarity. I mean, quite frankly, uh, given the, the political divide that we see in the Security Council, given how hard it is um, to get consensus on a number of, of issues, particularly around 
the humanitarian agenda, um, the resource gap, we're seeing the challenges around peacekeeping. What does it look like, quite frankly, to restore trust on one hand and then to, to reignite that global that global solidarity that is the theme of, of Unger Week? I mean, the, the theme is something which is set by the president of the, the General Assembly. Um, every, every General Assembly has a theme and mostly... Uh, leaders ignore it and, and forget about it <laughs> quite quickly. But uh, this issue of trust is a huge talking point around the UN. It's something that we hear from diplomats from all all regions. That there's a real a real lack of trust in UN diplomacy now, and you know, one of the reasons for that is something I, I just touched on, which is that a lot of countries from the developing world, um, you know, can list commitments that they have received from richer countries about help on economic growth or help on climate adaptation that have not been fulfilled. I think that for, um, yeah, I think for a lot of non-Western countries, uh, you know, this litany of disappointments weighs very heavily and makes them uh, suspicious of uh, getting into further commitments with, with, Western, with Western powers. Equally, I think that a lot of Western countries and especially European countries feel um, confused and alienated by the fact that um, uh, many, many UN members aren't offering more diplomatic support on Ukraine or aren't backing up a statement of support for Ukraine with, with sanctions um, against Russia. You know, there are different reasons for this, this lack of trust, but it is, it is permeating the, the institution. What, what could restore trust? I don't think you restore trust in a single week. Uh, you certainly don't restore trust by just having a bunch of side events in, in Turtle Bay where everyone says they must trust each other more, although I'm sure we will hear a lot of that rhetoric in the coming days. I, I mean, I, I think that the key, you know, the key planks for rebuilding trust are very much about um, finding some common ground on uh, getting economic development for poorer states back on track. Um, and in turn, countries from the, the global majority, the, the global south, uh, I think do need to keep up, you know, the sort of diplomatic support for, for Ukraine that we, we did witness um, in the early months of the war when the General Assembly passed a series of resolutions backing, backing Ukraine. So I think, you know, economic development and solidarity with Ukraine uh, are really essential uh, bases, if you will, for restoring some trust in this organisation. Thanks, Richard. And just to let our listeners know, we've got um, just about 15 minutes left for if they wanted to put any questions. And I've got one question, Richard, from one of our listeners at P. Um, Kirsten. Um, and he says, um, and I'll say it exactly as you said it, Richard, <laughs> will there be any relevance of the recent dynamics at other multilateral events, namely G20, BRICS, etc., at play? You, you started to hint at that within the context of development and um, economic um, global economic issues. Um, but be interested to get some more of your thoughts um, in answer, in response to this question from at P. Kirsten. Oh, it's always, it's always good to hear from uh, Piotr, Piotr Kersin, who was uh, a member of the UN team uh, ah. uh, years ago, back during the uh, uh, dog days of COVID. Um, and this is a good question, a relationship between the, uh, the UN and, and the G20. I mean, just to step back for a second, it's, it's unusual um, in that the G20 summit has just taken place in Delhi. Normally, the G20 meet later in the year. Uh, I think last year, when Indonesia was the president, it was in, in November. Um, you know, the Indians uh, decided to host the G20 just on the eve of the General Assembly. Uh, and in doing so, I think they have actually uh, slightly overshadowed um, the, UN, uh, the UN meeting because uh, we saw all the leaders get together with, with Prime Minister Modi in New Delhi um, they were talking about a lot of the issues that we're discussing now, such as reforming uh, the international financial architecture. And, uh, you know, they, they came to a consensus uh, around a lot of those issues. And there's a bit of a, there is a bit of a feeling that at the, at the UN, leaders of smaller countries are sort of picking up the crumbs <laughs> that were left behind from the G20 discussion. It, it is also really worth noting that Modi himself is not coming to New York. Um, Rishi Sunak, um, 
uh, from the UK and Emmanuel Macron um, from France. Uh, we're both at the G20, but have decided not to come to the UN. And so, you know, overall, there there is a bit of a feeling that the successful G20 summit in Delhi has detracted a bit from the importance of, of the General Assembly. Um, now, I think the big political story at the G20 was that, you know, India used its summit as an opportunity to present itself as a leader of the global north and implicitly as an, an alternative leader of the global a majority um, to China. And of course, Xi Jinping uh, decided not to go to Delhi, um, perhaps because um, he didn't want to uh, you know, give uh, give Mo Minister Modi any extra um, credibility. Uh, I, I mean, I think that was a very important, um, you know, I think that was a very important bit of political signaling by the Indians about their ambitions. Uh, but you know, Xi Jinping is not coming to the General Assembly. Uh, he hardly ever does. Uh, Modi um, has decided not to come to the UN on, on this occasion. Um, and so we're not really going to see that India-China contest for influence and leadership playing out so much at the UN uh, in contrast to the G20. That, that That's a really good, um, great response, Richard. And it says a lot also about the heft that the G20 carries, um, that you know a number of leaders saw it as imperative to go to New Delhi. Um, but at the same time, the masterstroke that, that, that Modi appears to to have played um, into that as well. And I think one of the I think one of the sort of important messages or one of the important features I see um, this week is how non-Western countries are this this moment effectively um, in the various um, forums that they've that they've been at and the BRICS and G20 being one of them. Richard, I'm going to put my next question to the side because I see we've got another one coming from um, a listener on the call. Um, Benji Sethi Amo, I apologise if I support your name, but his question, and I'm glad that this question has come through, is, hi Richard, do you think climate change would receive more attention due to the recent flooding both in Libya and Morocco? And this week, um, Crisis Group will be facilitating um, a meeting as we get ready for um, COP28 with, with the Emirati. So this is a very timely um, question, Richard. And for those of you who are listening, I would also urge you to follow um, our colleague, um, Claudia Cassini, who has been posting some very prolific, very sad, very painful um, um, images coming out from, from Libya. And she'll be putting her thoughts on paper about what this means um, for Libya. But, but Richard, um, with um, development in Libya and Morocco, um, what should we expect in terms of climate change conversations this week in Angle Week? I mean, you, you would hope um, that these tragic events do push leaders at the UN to, to take climate change more seriously. Uh, Antonio Guterres, the uh, UN Secretary General, is convening um, a summit, uh, I think on Wednesday, where he's getting leaders together um, to try and raise their level of ambition um, on limiting carbon emissions prior to COP28 in, in Dubai. Uh, I think there will be a lot of, a lot of good talk about these issues. Um, I have to say, being being honest though, we've you know we've seen this sort of cycle of uh, diplomacy around climate change at, at the UN before. I mean, it's now standard that there is a side event at the General Assembly, a leaders level side event um, on climate change. Uh, Guterres has prioritised this issue in the past. Um, he, in 2019, in particular, he really um, sort of insisted that it must be the top uh, the top topic of discussion at the UN. But often what we see is that there are statements of ambition in New York, but when you get to the COP meeting um, a few weeks down the line, uh, you know, countries sort of fail to come through with, with really significant pledges. I, you know, I, I do sense a certain, a certain loss of ambition around change amongst some members of the UN right now. I think that in the current economic climate, um, some UN members are, you know, quietly despairing of um, achieving the Paris goals. Uh, I think that Guterres would say that you know, this is effectively a recipe for global suicide if we, um, uh, if, if we give up on the fight against climate change. And I think it's absolutely right that um, he is pushing it, um, that the Emiratis are pushing it here, um, that you know, organizations like our own are pushing it. But um, I do have to say it's, uh, it, it feels like a harder and harder struggle every year. Yeah, I mean, Richard, one of the lines that we've been pushing very hard um, 
you know, is has the conflict affected countries themselves face distinct challenges in the in the climate arena. And I, I really do want to to say how Libya, you know, if you wanted a very tragic example, um, Libya is it. And um, you know, it's great that as Claudia has been telling us that international international assistance came in despite the very complicated international scene and very complicated political scene. But now that the rescue efforts will, you know, will come to the end, how do you ensure that international still um, engagement stays in there, both to deal with this very unfortunate um, um, in, in Libya, but also to deal with the country's own precarious political um, situation? Um, I have just to remind li um, listeners on the call, we've got about um, just over five five minutes or so left. Richard, one of the things, um, if you have any questions, that is, Richard, one of the things that I wanted to sort of um, ask you to sort of explain a little bit further, because I was struck um, by its inclusion, I, I, I take on board what you say about climate change, but you have been a promoter, we have been a promoter at Crisis Group um, in terms of global challenges about where the UN can play a useful, innovative, facilitative, um, providing a global framework on, on issues. And we, he's put a spotlight in this year's briefing on artificial, artificial inter intelligence. Why? How can the, the UN help manage the risks um, around um, artificial intelligence? How can it be the global voice on defining the framework, um, both in terms of the the positives, but also the concerns that a number of are now um, articulating on on artificial intelligence. I mean, this is this is another issue which, like climate change, is I think very very much the top of the mind of Antonio Guterres, um, the Secretary General, uh, and it, it, it is of deep concern, I think, and rightly to Guterres that we are seeing incredible advances in artificial intelligence and, and other realms of innovation like biotechnology. And there simply are no robust multilateral frameworks to regulate um, these new technologies. Uh, Guterres has tried to focus uh, leaders' minds on this. Um, he's announced that next year, September 2024, he will convene something that is rather grandly entitled the Summit of the Future. And the Summit of the Future is an event uh, where it is meant to come together and try and at least agree some guidelines um, for negotiating common position on how you govern uh, artificial intelligence, how you govern uh, digitalization and other uh, big technological breakthroughs. And, you know, we are seeing some UN members, uh, you know, sort of joining this call for greater regulation. Um, of AI in particular. It's something which uh, the UK, um, we hosted a Security Council meeting on. Uh, so so this is coming into focus. I mean, I would say that very, very few diplomats around the UN really understand uh, what AI is or how it works. Um, so, you know, the conversation is a bit tentative. Um, but nonetheless, the conversation is definitely gaining in intensity. What we're going to see over the coming year is how far are the big players in artificial intelligence, are um, like the US and China, willing to go in terms of agreeing multilateral rules of the road for managing uh, these technologies which they're developing so fast and in a very competitive fashion. Um, it is possible that despite efforts um, from the UN agreement on regulation around these new technologies that just some of the big players don't want to submit, uh, to um, international norms in how they uh, they use AI and other advances. But I, I think at a minimum, the UN is a good space uh, to have talks about um, you know, the security implication of AI, the ways that AI could be used to accelerate um, economic development. Uh, it, it, it is, the UN is still, um, a pretty solid platform for those sorts of discussion. And I should say, um, if you want to look at our analysis of the UN and, and AI, or our analysis of uh, the UN and climate change, uh, those are both issues which are featured in our annual briefing on, on 10 challenges for the UN. Um, uh, a really, uh, there's a really interesting discussion of AI in there um, that our Future of Conflict team worked up. And there's also quite a detailed discussion of how uh, 
the UAE, as the president of um, COP28, is bringing conflict issues into the conversation about climate change. So if we've whetted your appetite, I would um, uh, go to the Crisis Group website and, and download our, our UNGA briefing because it covers those issues in um, quite some depth. Yeah, and one of the key takeaways I had, Richard, in just conversations with you and colleagues in the in the programme, but also in the UN as well, is that, you know, that the, the institution, the UN itself, may be able to help frame the debate around AI's use, set some guidelines for its application, and also help manage the, sort of the geopolitical um, tensions that AI is, in, in, is intensifying. Richard, you mentioned the, the summit of the future, and I think one of the concerns there is that the SG has not found it easy to build momentum for that summit um, of the future for next year. Some some developing countries um, seeing it or arguing that it has sort of you know, been distracting um, from the 2023 gathering to discuss, you know, SDG issues. I have one more question that I'm going to take, Richard, and then I think we 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 sort of wrap it up um, with um, with the conversation. Um, another, so the last one um, is: How do you think um, the G20's recent decision to give a permanent seat to the African Union will impact the potential reform of the United Nations Security Council, especially regarding the permanent membership of its members? Will we see a similar move at the UN level as well, with a permanent Security Council seat for an African and Latin American countries blocks of the countries? Um, Richard, keep it short because I know it's your favourite hobby, and uh, yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll sort of add my views to hear your views on this one. <laughs> um, look, what I would simply say is that I think I think the fact that the G20 were able to give the AU a seat, you know, emphasizes that we're we're in a period where it's a lot easier to transform the sort of informal clubs like the G7, G20, or the BRICS uh, than it is to transform formal multilateral institutions like the UN. And so, you know, we, we've also seen the BRICS expanding to bring in um, a lot of a lot of new members uh, at their recent summit in South Africa. I, I mean, I think that if, as is probable, it proves impossible to reform the Security Council, um, then that creates incentives for um, powers like India or blocs like the African Union um, to increasingly look to do serious diplomatic business elsewhere. And I mean, this is a point that, again, we can our um, thing on challenges for the UN. You know, it's, it's easy to be cynical about Security Council reform, but we do have to remember that if you don't progress on council reform, uh, lots of middle, middle powers and bigs are simply going to go uh, to other settings and, and prioritise other settings like the G20 or, or like the BRICS. Um, I, I fear that that is... The direction of travel at the moment. I mean, I don't. I personally don't get too panicky <laughs> about about the fact that um, influence is flowing away from from the UN to these other formats. If the other formats can solve problems, good. Um, you know, Crisis Group is a pragmatic organisation. We want to see problems solved. If if the G20 um, or indeed the BRICS can um, better job of managing global problems, they should do it. Uh, but we should recognise that. Um, the more that countries and the more that blocks like the AU focus on that sort of informal club diplomacy, um, you know, the more marginal uh, formal institutions like the, the, the forums around become. A very good note to end on, Richard, and just as a believer in partnerships as well, and, you know, the line from, from Crisis Group and certainly one of our predecessors was that this is not a beauty contest. Um, the the peace, international peace and security landscape is more precarious. I think it, the UN can't go it alone. It needs to work with other actors, other regions. Um, its political legitimacy is derived from that partnership and that network. And I think the future of multilateralism, if we're going to save it, if we're going to ensure um, that multilateralism remains and that there is a better, more robust crisis management system that the UN has to work with with, with other partners. And I think that is the lesson um, from the last year. But also, as you quite rightly say, Richard, and, and um, we conclude even in the, in the paper, is that there are still reasons to believe in the UN um, and that it can play a role in, in maintaining international peace and security, um, even um, despite the, the geopolitical um, picture that we see that remains um, bleak. Um, thank you to all of you for joining us on this call. Um, if you have any other questions that you'd like to um, have from us, um, please feel free to um, either ping myself or Richard um, Gowan. 
Um, really great to have you on this call, Richard. Um, very good to also be accompanying you and your team um, this week, and we look forward to further conversations. Um, just to also let you all know, um, those of you who are following Ungle Week, that Richard and his team, um, for the first time this year, and hopefully it goes on because you've raised expectations, Richard, will be giving us a nightly um, updates of all the big developments that are unfolding here. Um, in the in in Unga, in New York. Thank you very much to all of you. Um, thank you, Richard, uh, for being co-host with me, and um, look forward to to seeing you all um, in the future. Thank you. Back, back back to the meetings. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>